Hello and welcome back to my channel where we summarize education related research one study at a time so that you can incorporate it into your practice. Well, today we're doing something a little bit different. Normally we go study by study and we just talk about one study at a time. But today I would like to talk about something a little bit different. This was sent to me by a colleague. What we're going to go over today is a news article. It comes from the world of journalism rather than the world of research, but it compiled a lot of research together. And so I am comfortable sharing it on this channel because it is research based. I checked into the references and the author and there was a whole team of even fact checkers and things like that. And the article is written in a really accessible way. So I will link it below. So this report is called at a loss for words, how a flawed idea is teaching millions of kids to be poor readers. So I know, I know, I know, I know this sounds scary. Don't click away. I think that this could be really helpful to you if you work in the primary division and you teach little kids or you do something related to helping kids learn to read. But in order for your ears to actually work during this video, because it is a bit of a doozy, uh, we're going to have to put our egos aside for a little bit. So, you know what, one sec. We can all do this, this will be helpful. So just, I'm gonna open this up. We're gonna check our egos at the door. And I promise I will give this back to you at the end of the video so that you can go on with your day. So let's get started. A little bit of background. This study was published by APM Report, the American Public Media. The mission statement for APM is that it strives to raise awareness, trigger debate, and prompt positive change via nonpartisan, independent, investigative, and documentary journalism. The author of this article is Emily Hanford, and I looked her up. She actually won awards for her journalism in educational research, so she does have a background in working with research. I'm going to link her bio page below because she has a lot of great stuff that you can go follow. If you are teaching kids to read or evaluating their reading and you are using the three queuing system or MSV, then you are doing it wrong. This idea was theorized in 1967 and involves three points. So graphic cues, syntactic cues, and semantic cues. Graphic cues is looking at the letters. Syntactic cues is figuring out what kind of word makes sense for the sentence. Should it be a noun? Should it be a verb? And semantic cues is trying to figure out what could fit based on the context. So if I look at the pictures, if I know a bit of background, what word makes sense for what I'm trying to read? This theory is based on the idea that readers don't need to go letter by letter or sound by sound to try and figure out what a word is going to be. They just need to have enough background information on what the word should be to be able to predict. So it's really big on predicting what the word should be and pulling that together to make sense when you're reading. And it's rooted in the idea that it's not only important to be able to read, but it's important to be able to understand what you're reading and build meaning when you're reading. You might have in your class things like eagle eye and Skippy the frog and lips the fish. Eagle eye, you're looking at the pictures to help you out. Skippy the frog, you're just skipping those words. When I was first teaching, I had a student use the skip it strategy so effectively that he skipped all the words in the book and was like, well, I'm done. I was like, well, I mean, you used your strategies. I can't really knock you. We've read zero words in this book, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. The article talks about how previous to this type of thinking, uh, the big two sort of schools of thought about how reading works were phonics and whole word. So phonics is where you go letter by letter, sound by sound, and you sound out the words every time. And then whole word is that you're supposed to be able to memorize words at a time. So you should be able to see it and you instantly know. And when you think about it, when we read, we don't always go letter by letter, sound by sound. But where we're practicing how to read, we do go letter by letter, sound by sound. The author of this article talks about how phonics and whole word or whole language um, battled it out until the three queuing system came into place. And when the three queuing system came into place, that kind of took the world by storm. As the three queuing system came into popularity, MSV was developed. Meaning, sentence structure, visual information. Or those are the three strategies that we teach kids to be able to read. 
So M is for meaning. So um, what meanings could we use to figure the word out? S is for sentence structure. So what about the sentence tells us what should come next? Is it going to be a noun, a verb? Does, is it going to make sense for the structure of the sentence? And then visual. So what do the letters tell us so that we can guess what the word might be? So let's look at the first letter and see if that helps us out. After the three queuing system had been around for a while and in vogue and MSV was a thing, cognitive psychologists started revisiting reading and wanted to learn more about it. And they found some pretty interesting stuff. They don't need a ton of context to read the words and they don't even need a ton of context to understand what it is that they're reading, which is the whole making meaning component of reading that MSV is based on. The way good readers read is we see letters, we scan them, put them together, make a word. Cognitive psychologists also found that using context to guess words, so predict words, wasn't a good strategy even for good readers. They weren't good at guessing what the word should be. So I'm sure we can all think of examples of this. We're reading a book with our kids at the table. Um, we've got guided reading. We're gonna try and get two groups in today. We open up the book, we do our picture walk, we do all the predicting, and we come to the word swing. We need the kid to be able to read the word swing. They get to the word, they cannot figure it out. So we go, okay, hmm, you don't know that word? No. Okay, well, let's look at the first letter. What could that first letter be? It's an S. Okay, it's an S. What sound does S make? S yes, perfect, you've got your S. Okay, okay, so what word could it be? Sun. Sun, does that make sense? Let's read the sentence. Billy was playing on the sun. Now you've got a kid who's laughing because it's hilarious that you made a joke about a kid playing on the sun. The other kids at the table are also laughing. And then you're trying to get the kid to understand that it doesn't make sense that Billy could play on the sun. But the kid is like, no, I can think of a context when Billy can play on the sun. This kid starts going into an elaborate reason and everybody's getting derailed. So you, you gather them all back. No, no, no. Okay, so we've sounded out the letter. We've asked if it made sense. We're gonna look at the picture. Let's look at the picture and let's see if we could see what this word might be. What could make sense? Slide. Slide? No, no. Seesaw. Not seesaw. Close, we're, we're getting there. Sand. Sand, no, no. Why are there so many S words on this page? My goodness, this is not helping you read. So now your budding reader has used the following strategies. They've looked at one letter of the word, they have looked at some pictures, come up with an elaborate, outlandish reason why somebody could play on the sun. They've derailed your whole guided reading group because they also think it's funny. They've named every S word on the picture, but they haven't actually read the word, the thing that you're at the guided reading table to do. And now that I say this out loud, I'm starting to realize why my guided reading never really went well. It gets better. So oh, the article then details about how phonics came back into play. We had a lot of research about phonics and it was widely accepted that phonics is in fact important. You can't just cue. And so instead of using phonics as our starting point for teaching about reading, it got lumped in with MSV in, it got rebranded as balanced literacy. Do we all practice balanced literacy in our schools? I think a lot of us might. And so the premise was kind of that if we do everything, something's got to stick. Let's give them phonics. Let's give them some cueing systems, lots and lots of strategies. Pick one, it'll work. This is a good time to stop and take a break and just explain that I am in no way trying to villainize teachers or make them seem like they didn't do their due diligence or that they're inept and they don't know what they're doing because they've used this. The MSV and balanced literacy are typically board mandated. They're policies, they get lumped into the way that you're evaluated as a teacher. Um, and there's a lot of documentation that you have to do to prove that you have implemented these systems in your classroom. So it's not teacher's fault that this has been used. Okay, so back to balanced literacy. Uh, kids who struggle with reading tend to rely more on the MSV cueing system than on the phonics, and they don't actually learn to read very well. The author also noted that about 40% of students actually will pick up reading no matter what cute, what system you use, so you kind of have to take that into account, not use it as an anecdotal bias and say, well, I have a good chunk of kids who did learn to read, so it must work. The next thing that the author talks about in the article is about how good readers do actually read. And the author talks about how good readers use 
orthographic mapping. So in orthographic mapping, readers can instantly read a word just by looking at it because they know the letter sequence, the pronunciation, and the word meaning all in one go. But to get to be good readers, kids need to be able to sound out words. After they can sound out words, they can store those words in their memory and then devote more space to worrying about what they mean and what they would mean in different contexts. But the initial phase to actually learn how to read those words is to sound it out. So you have to be able to sound things out first and decode and then work on meaning second. It's really helpful for kids if they have a rich understanding of many words and what those word meanings are. So it's a good practice as a teacher to show kids lots of words visually and talk about their meanings and build a rich vocabulary. And that way when kids come to words that they don't understand, they can sound it out and make the connection that, okay, I've heard this word before and it stores in their memory better. So then the author had to ask the question, why are we still using MSV? How did we get to this point where we have all this great research about how phonics are so important and sounding out words are important and vocabulary is important and how the three cueing system is actually detrimental to reading? If we know all of this, why do school boards purchase all of these materials for schools that are based on the queuing system? So the author talks about how nobody really did their due diligence. Nobody has gone and checked into the research and really looked at how these things work or why they work or if they work at all. And so that is problematic. The other thing that happened too is that the people who invented the three queuing system and MSV have reached the masses of educators through products. They've come up with very systematic reading programs and sold them to schools. And if something's on the market targeted for educators, you would think that it would be based on research. Their job is to make money, not to actually make kids learn to read. Our job as educators is to do better for our kids. What are our takeaways for teaching? Well, if you are teaching kids how to read, work on those phonics, get kids to practice their sounds, teach them vocabulary, teach them words that they will be approaching. And then once the kids build fluency with reading, then you can talk about more meaning and comprehension of the text. But as a starting place, phonics matter first. Okay, well that is all I have for you today. Um, hold on one second. As promised, I will return your egos. If you wanna leave some of your ego here because of what we just learned, that is acceptable, I totally understand. Take whatever you need back. Well, thank you so much for watching. Please pass this video on to anybody that you think might benefit from it. All of the links, like I said, are in the description box below. Subscribe and hit the bell button so that you don't miss another video. And as always, if you have any other topics, please feel free to leave them in the comments so that I can find a study that talks about them and we can review it together. And I will see you next time. Happy educating. Bye.